All right, the fast version, because we're 10 minutes in. Apparently, Macs don't work every single time. Um, hi, my name is Adam Hitchcock. I work at Discuss, as you just heard. You can follow me on Twitter or something. Uh, shit, okay, cool. Uh, sweet, let's just start off the bat. We're hiring, but we're also American. So uh, if you want to leave Europe, come talk to me. Uh, but that would be crazy. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Um, first, I'm going to address the issue of why did I lie to you last year? Uh, then I'm going to say, what's a SOA? Why should you SOA? What are different data patterns in SOA? How does Discuss do it with both a legacy and um, Greenfield's app, uh, example? And um, does that work for us? Uh, so last year, my talk was entitled, How Discuss Does It When It Isn't Django? And it was a placeholder for services. I, it, was, it was a talk about uh, the, a very similar topic, but saying specifically, hey, you don't have to use Django for everything. It's not what the cool kids are doing. But um, the why do I sit on a throne of lies is the main question. So when I got back uh, from EuroPython uh, last year, my CTO told, basically uh, said, hey, we're going to make a technology choice. And that technology choice is Django. We're going to redouble our investment in it because we, we are a huge Django shop. So we already are really good at it. Um, and there's some really great reasons for it. Using standards across the company that are also known outside the company makes it super easy to hire. And there's a huge community. So we want to leverage all of that in both our legacy application and the platform we're moving to. So I kind of had to challenge my thinking about Django and find uh, some new ways to use it. Uh, so here is take two, is how Discuss does it, Django edition. Uh, so if I ask you to raise your hands, who will raise their hands? <laughs> All right. So about 60%. Cool. Who already knows what SOA stands for? Cool. That's like 120% because more of you raised... <laughs> Uh, were you correct, I, I guess? So it's, it stands for service-oriented architecture, or if you're British, service-orientated architecture. Uh, and I'm going to define what, I'm, what I think that means right now. So uh, a, a SOA is something that I like to pronounce TLAs, or TLAs, you know, three-letter acronyms. So a SOA is uh, a system that you've architected in a specific way. Uh, that system should have discrete software components or, um, those are basically running programs, and those are called services. Those running programs should have simple, well-defined APIs uh, or, or interfaces, and, and those are the APIs through which they're going to communicate. Then you can loosely coordinate or loosely federate these services uh, to achieve some sort of business goal. Uh, in ASOA, there's two primary roles. There's a service provider and service consumers, and these are providers and consumers of data, and you can totally do both. That's cool. We're not going to mark you points for that. Uh, and it's not a new idea at all. Uh, Doug McIlroy, who um, I think he worked at Bell Labs a long time ago, said this of the Unix philosophy. Uh, the Unix philosophy is write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together and write programs to handle text streams because that is a universal interface. Uh, and he was talking about Unix pipes and programs talking over uh, file descriptors on the same system. We're talking about network pipes and programs talking over file descriptors over the network. So they're really the exact same philosophy, uh, and, and I think this still holds true today. Uh, it's also not necessarily a new idea in web systems. It's been, people have been doing this for many years. Uh, you're probably already using services in your system. Um, how many of you are Django app developers day to day? Just like, sweet, a lot of you. Excellent. You're probably using Postgres if you're doing it right, or MySQL if you're doing it also right. Um, <laughs> or Redis. Uh, you're probably using queues in your system. Um, Rabbit or Kafka. Kafka is not technically a queue, but it's basically a queue, so I put it on the queues list. Uh, or you're using external API. Who knows what Kafka is? Sweet, I will talk about that later. It's awesome. Um, if someone asks me, it reminds me. Uh, so external APIs are also services. Uh, everything is a service. Single page Java apps are great examples of consumer services usually, but if they do a post command back to your server, that's now producing data. Uh, so why should you do a SOA? Uh, this is basically my, my um, uh, report card for later in the talk. Uh, this, you know, I think that if you've done it right, 
You can have services written in any language. You can, it doesn't matter what machines those services run on. And if those services have a strong API, it doesn't matter how they store or abstract that data internally. It's just the API that matters. Uh, services should scale independently of each other, and they should also provide you easier testability, easier deployment, and because you've split your system up into well-defined chunks, it should be easier for individuals to maintain conceptual integrity or understanding of the system. Uh, so hopefully you can learn how to do all those things in this talk. Um, I think that in a SOA it's really important to know, like when you're saying, okay, well, sweet, I want to make a SOA, well, how? So I think that you have to understand the data patterns in your system, and I see two primary data patterns. Um, there's kind of transactional data and uh, asynchronous data. Transactional further is divided by into two areas, I think. There's, are you doing transactional data against basically database models, some sort of straight representation of, of an object in your system, like a user? Uh, then REST works really well. It's CRUD semantics against a model. Uh, if you need to do something where you're combining data and math or logic to say, hey, recommend something to me or can I do something, then RPC is a model that works really well and that's a more procedural thing. Uh, if your response is the same every time, then REST might work well. That's kind of the way I think about it. Um, then asynchronous data maps really well to queuing systems or pub sub systems. Uh, it's really good when you have high CPU or long running workloads that you can't do in a web request cycle. Uh, so you also have to pick your APIs. There's two parts here. You need to pick what are the bytes that I'm gonna send to the other person or other service and how am I gonna send those bytes to the other service. Uh, how many people know what protobufs or thrifts or message pack or Avro is? So all of those are examples of non-JSON encodings of how do you put an object across the net, like in a format that other languages can read. So picking something uh, from that list is super important because in order to have a heterogeneous environment, you need to have uh, encoding that multiple languages can work. Pickle is not on this list. <laughs> it's, yeah. Ugh, I just spent the last week removing pickle from something. Okay. Um, so, uh, you also have to pick your transportation protocol. So, HTTP, who knows what that is? It's literally every person in this room. That was the lowest number of hands. Okay, so HTTP stands for Hypertext Transport Protocol, if you don't know, since no one raised their hands. Anyway, so it's, um, you know, or, or Thrift. Thrift provides a network binding as well. Uh, I like HTTP and JSON because they're super easy to do. Django does them really well out of the box. And HTTP is great if you actually read the, the spec, or don't even read the spec, like read the Wikipedia page on the spec, you'll learn a lot. Uh, things like the accept header. So if you, you can start with, with HTTP plus JSON, and if your clients are, or if your server respects the accept header, you can support multiple encodings when you go forward. You can say, I accept application JSON or text JSON. In the f f future, you can say, I accept application protobuf or protobuf version two, whatever. Uh, and then, you know, HTTP works great too. It has things like keep alive as a connection option. Uh, negotiating that initial connection a little expensive, but uh, when you're going forward with, with HTTP, it's just like if you're keeping the, the, the connection alive, it costs about the same as any other protocol. Um, you know, if you need to save the eight bytes you get from going from thrift, or from HTTP to thrift, I mean, it's sweet, your Facebook, but uh, if not, anyways. So, um, Transactional data stuff, uh, REST, Django does it really well out of the box. That's basically what it's been doing for the last, I don't know how, like million years. So, uh, but in recent years, uh, we, we used to use like Django forms and those suck and other Django things that are easy to make bad practices in. Django REST framework is a rel relatively recent framework that makes it super easy to keep your code organized and clean while providing uh, RESTful access to your database models. Uh, it's really cool, check it out. There's a Kickstarter campaign, it's awesome. Or, or you can roll your own API. There were definitely, we hit lots of performance snags with REST framework, but we also got around them very easily. Uh, come talk to me about how I do awesome caching things and versioning in that framework. I'm gonna probably write a blog post about it. But cool, RPC is also is the other transactional. Uh, like I said, logic heavy APIs, 
recommendation services, authorization, authentication. I don't like RPC as a first stop because it's prone to over-specialization when you're building APIs. You make APIs that are really good at doing one thing, and if you're using, if you're, when you're building a platform, you want to make APIs that can support you know, lots of things to be built on top of them. Sometimes you need a, a specialized API, but if you can do it in a generalized way, I think that's better. Uh, in other systems like Thrift and Zero RPC, which are super easy to use, uh, that's their downfall. Uh, you can abstract away the fact that you're actually doing a remote procedure call. So I've seen code that it's lots of Thrift requests in a, like, serially, like 50 of them, and they're like, why is it slow? Like, because you just did 50 network requests and you waited for each one to finish before starting the next. So, yeah, it's slow. HTTP, you usually know you're using HTTP because you imported HTTP lib or requests or something. Uh, Asynchronous, good for high CPU, long running tasks. There's a couple ways to do this. I think Django is a great en entry point that are management commands. These are highly underutilized on the server. We have a pattern of while true, do work in our management command. And so uh, we can basically do something forever. So if, uh, in our ads system, we have to rank ads basically forever. It's just constant CPU. And, so, and, and we never want to not do that. So cron jobs don't really work very well because there's like a minute in between the, the jobs. Uh, Celery, how many people know what Celery is? Excellent, I don't have to explain this then. So yeah, Celery is a tasking system, great pattern for asynchronous work, post save hook, and a Celery task. Uh, Celery can also use JSON, which is uh, supporting our heterogeneous requirement. So the, um, we, we wrote something called Go Celery, uh, our DevOps lead, Matt Robinault, did that. Uh, because we need to parse Celery tasks in Go. So if you're doing that in Pickle, you can't do that because nothing else can read Pickle. So use, uh, use JSON, something platform independent. And Celery Beat is great for periodic tasks that you need to do, like data import. Uh, Django also has been incredibly easy for us to run. Uh, it has an incredibly well understood I.O. loop, which is uh, wait for a command or outsource the I.O. loop itself to something else, like uWSGI. Uh, it has multiple entry points. Wisgi, it can be run, Wisgi can be run in uh, like Nginx directly, uWisgi, Apache, Mod Wisgi, and pro, uh, G Unicorn, and a million other things. So it's great because those things handle the IO loop, and Wisgi just has to respond to here's a dictionary of specific information. Management commands, also, you're in control of the IO loop there. Celery tasks and Celery beat, the same. They're just listening on, uh, on cues. Uh, to respond to information. So it's really great because it's basically each of these is a message passing interface at the end of the day. They either generate or respond to messages. Uh, so how do we do this at Discuss? Um, uh, first we'll look at Discuss Web, which is a legacy product. Uh, it's a monolithic Django product. Uh, it is this many lines of code, 183,000, and that's just because we deleted a lot of code recently. It was great. like. Huh? 67,000 lines or something. Um, so it's over seven years old, and we made a lot of bad decisions along the way, uh, but some good ones too. When we're deploying this in our service-oriented way, we deploy the entire code base. Uh, we, we, we decided to, it's impossible at its current state for us to break it up into multiple code bases. So we have to deploy the entire thing, and that means we end up treating it like a library. We cluster machines by purpose, so at the end of the day, those will be our, our service. Uh, and by doing this, we kind of see these CPU patterns emerge. Uh, it makes scaling easier at the end of the day. You say, oh, we need a different kind of computer, high CPU for one uh, thing, and high memory for a different purpose. And then we, we route to these services uh, or clusters uh, based on host name. So we use Varnish and HAProxy in order to route, uh, route requests, and then further based on the path, to get them to the, to the right machine. That plays into our data, into, uh, data transparency point. And then when we're, when we're deploying, we do a three-phase deploy. So there are multiple versions of the services out at any given time. It goes old version, old and new version, just new version. So you, we always have to make sure that whenever we upgrade anything, it will play nice in that uh, route. To change the, the entry points on these, uh, in these clusters, we use different settings.py files. Uh, I haven't seen this done a ton in the wild, so I wanted to, to highlight it. 
But basically, by using multiple settings.py files, we're able to drastically change the behavior of, uh, of the Django, the discussed library, right? So we can uh, have different URLs, different middlewares, uh, different uh, template request contacts. Templates, it's something interesting, template request contacts, are, I don't think they're lazy loaded. So if you put something that you want in one of your templates in a global request context, like if, you, if you're setting that up in a middleware or something, that's gonna execute every time. And so even if you're using it like 80% of the time, 20% of the time, that's wasted cycles, wasted IO. So having a, a uh, <clears throat> being able to separate that out per service. Uh, URL rev resolution is also uh, O of N. So Django will go down your URLs list doing, does this match this regular expression? Does it match this regular expression? And so if your uh, most commonly UR used URLs are at the bottom of that list, uh, you're gonna have a bad time. So we found actually in our um, API service by reordering those, we found a 15% CPU saving because our most used URL was at the bottom. It was literally the last one. And simply putting it and about 15 others out of a list of, of several hundred to the top, uh, we got a huge savings. Uh, so do that. Someone just make a cool product that, or project that does that automatically. Uh, so two examples of services. We have our public API, which if you, it's discuss.com slash API. It's how we use our own product in the wild. And it's also how anyone that wants to integrate with it uses it. Uh, it has a ton of middleware, um, I think dozens of them. It has over 300 URL routes, and it has uh, several things that automatically get loaded for templates. Our internal objects API, so this is a internal to our data center, very raw model uh, representation. It has no middleware, it only has one URL route, and uh, it has no, it basically has nothing. It's settings up high, it's like 12 lines long. Uh, so there's an enormous difference in speed between these two setups. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have a graph to show that, but I can probably tweet one later. Uh, so did it work for us? Uh, yeah, you know, it kind of worked fine. Um, it was still a large code base, and we got all of the problems of having a large code base with it still. Uh, version conflicts, still very problematic. Whether it's a function or, or method that you're changing, you've got to integrate that over the entire code base still, or an external package upgrade. Uh, we've had lots of problems with um, uh, Zookeeper uh, Kazoo over the last uh, two years because there were several incompatibilities there, and people were using different versions. So uh, the conceptual integrity is basically still hard of this entire thing because you still have uh, almost 200,000 lines of code. So on our report card, we did okay. Uh, we got our heterogeneous environment and we utilized that. We have the, the Go celery tasks, data location transparency, independent scalability, and easier deployments. Uh, something I didn't say about those deployments, we can actually deploy those services, those service clusters separately. So if we need to deploy just something for one of them, uh, we, in an emergency, we can totally do that. Uh, we usually deploy the entire thing at the same time, though. So uh, now the ad server. So this is a product that's about a year and a half old. And it, um, <clears throat> it was started as a Flask uh, application, as I talked about in my previous talk last year, and uh, other custom stuff. So in the last year, we've ported it from that to Django, uh, and we made some decisions when we did that. We want to make sure that we use Django apps very well. Django best practices are best practices for a reason. They really help you architect your system in a good way. We want to leverage Django beyond WSGI. We want to use all those entry points like the, the management commands and celery tasks. And we want to split up our code base very intentionally. We uh, want to have one code base that can access the database. Uh, and, and I'm talking about model access, like uh, using the ORM. Uh, and the other... Uh, uh, code base could only access that sort of information via the strong API. So that's just, uh, we, we separate the services in that, that regard. But we do have multiple services that can access the database. So this is just uh, some of the services that go into the ad system. We have our data API. This maps really well to REST framework and it has some minimal RPC endpoints because we need to do mass data export for other services. We basically just need an endpoint that says everything, give me everything. 
And so then we have our ad serving API. This is basically a recommendations API, and it's an RPC endpoint. Then we have the, our, our asynchronous tasks, scoring and cache warming, keeping caches uh, hot with re recent information. And these are run using management commands in that while true, do something. And then the ads data import service, which is celery and celery beat. These are either responding to new objects getting created and having to collect more information about them, or looking for what's changed in other systems on a batch process, like every five minutes, what was created in a different system, and import that information for, for uh, scoring and other purposes. And this is how we organized it. Uh, there's the two on top have the ads uh, stuff. Because we're leveraging lots of frameworks, we get to um, only have 11,000 lines of code compared to 180,000. And then on the bottom, those are the, the warming services and such, and that's also, they're very close in lines of code, about 11,000. Uh, and this is what it looks like with boxes and arrows. So on the far left, you have JavaScript land, then it, there's the internet, then you kind of have a web serving, oh, I'm supposed to use the mouse, okay. Boom, now you have like a web serving layer here, and then you have all of our backend services. And these are again coded by, uh, colored by code base, just so you can see how that goes. And here are the ba uh, backing technologies for that. So backbone on the front end, we have our Django, UWSGI, uh, with Nginx layer, and then our backing stuff. So, yeah. so uh, did this work? Uh, I think it was kind of amazing. Ah, I didn't play more than once. Ah, it's so good, why is it not looping? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, did it work? <laughs> All right, uh, I think it worked really well. Uh, we, the, the only downside is, is the inverse downside. Well, we had problems that small code bases have. It's hard to share code when you have lots of code bases. I hate things like Git subtree and stuff. Those are just going to hurt you. So we ended up making a third code base for sharing stuff. We use pip internally, so uh, we, we, just, we run our own cheese shop, so we, we just deploy a package out there that is the ads core package for shared information. And that actually even helps us make even better code. Django best practices helped us a lot in the long term. I wish we actually were more strict on those. Uh, and we definitely made it easy to understand the entire system. Because it's, uh, everything is, there's so few lines of code and everything's encapsulated so well, it's easy to quickly add new things as long as they're being added as an individual item. Easy, easy to test everything. Uh, integration tests are more important because you need to integrate with other processes, not just other libraries. So you, you need to do a really good job of testing your external APIs. Uh, so you know the, the Django test client becomes way more important than I like it to be because it's slow. Uh, then service APIs live a long time. So you're gonna need to learn how to version them and support them for, for extended periods of time. Uh, I definitely have like a couple days every couple of months that's like, okay, I'm gonna go find everyone else's code, where are they using the version of the API I want to delete and fix it for them. Uh, we get fast deployments. Uh, our deployments are about two minutes. And then our testing is like a couple seconds uh, right now per, per, um, per service. So it's pretty fast in general. Uh, and yeah, they scale independently. So we got all of our check marks on our report card, yay. Uh, is it a success for Discuss? It's a knockout success. That was really bad. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's easier to run overall. The, the, it's easier to understand and, and build new systems in, in this uh, environment. You don't have to, uh, we, we can hire an employee that never has to see legacy code, and I'm jealous of them. But, uh, and it's easier to not break existing systems because you're not touching them. Uh, what, what you can't accidentally break something that you're not committing code to. Well, okay, you can, but it's harder. Uh, so as a roundup, do one thing and do it well. You want to examine your data patterns up front and then look, based on that data pattern, you need to make some decisions. Those are gonna be API decisions around protocol, transport, and what methodology are you using to access uh, uh, that data. And then Django has multiple entry points. You should definitely use them. Don't, it's not just a WSGI machine. And then do one thing and do it well. It's 
That is the one line from the talk you should remember. Uh, here's some links. Uh, go support Django REST framework. It's got a Kickstarter. It's got a ton of money right now. I don't even. I don't. I don't know if he even wants more money, but you know, it's a great thing. Support it. Uh, here's our Go Celery stuff. Django best practices. I like Lincoln Loop. They're out of Portland, I think. There are some awesome people, and they are really good thought leaders in just how to do Django development in general. And the Unix philosophy. It's a great Wikipedia page. Uh, so if that was interesting to you and you hate Europe, come to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, questions, yeah, which still... I already have one of. Uh, about three phases deployment. Uh, oh, yeah. In, in case of the service which uses a database directly, that one you mentioned, Oh yeah, yeah. How do you manage that? Because actually, uh, database is only at one version, I guess. Yeah. So we basically roll forward. So when we want to do something to upgrade our database, we um, <clears throat> you we change the code. Uh, we change our Django models. We make the SQL that will do that upgrade. We run that upgrade. When you're adding a new column type that's okay, like if you're adding a new column, sweet. Uh, Django will run with additional columns, it will ignore that. If you're changing a column type, well you can't do that because you, we, we have, um, we exceeded the ID variable for one, for one of, or the, I, the, the size of ID in one of our tables. So now we're all like big ID or big in ID, whatever it is. Big, what is it, was it big sequential? Some Postgres thing, I don't know how to SQL. But, so the point is, you can't do that. You cannot change your models. It's very expensive and basically impossible. But you can totally add to them. So it goes to data planning, but also because it's behind the API, uh, you can always abstract that. So we have models that are, we have, it has its one model, it has its tables, and then it kind of has adjunct models that are meta information for that. And as a consumer of the API, I don't even care because I don't even know that that exists. It's up to that service to manage all of that. Uh, right, just a question. Uh, what do you do for uh, logging and monitoring? Because you already have lots of things oh, yeah. in your SOA and lots of external dependencies. And I dread when something happens in Celery or RabbitMQ and I have to go to the manual, start read again, and I have no idea what's going on. So yeah. what do you do for that? So I'm not on the ops team but I have a little bit of insight into how that works because uh, we use the same infrastructure to manage our applications. And we basically use StatsD for everything. Who knows what StatsD is? We're still in the participation phase. Okay, cool. StatsD is basically a daemon that runs locally or anywhere because uh, it's a service. Woo! And uh, you can talk UDP to it and it will basically, over a period, aggregate information and then beacon that out to somewhere else. Uh, what's usually called a collection service. And then that collection service will take everything as collected and tell uh, Graphite or something about that. And so we use Graphite. We use, um, uh, oh, I forget the thing that actually does the alerting. Um, Nagios? No, can't remember. But we basically have Graphite, uh, graphite stats. We alert on thresholds on those stats and we have them for hardware and software. And we, so we have thousands and thousands and thousands of different metrics being tracked. And by aggregating the correct ones, you can have a pretty good uh, in, uh, intuition on the, um, on the system. I want to answer one question I was asked last night because I thought it was particularly interesting, which I was talking to, to Tom Christie and he was saying, what was the most challenging part about designing your new system? And uh, I was surprised when I found it was actually just the software architecture. It was making sure that we don't write that spaghetti code because when you're, when you're taking an idea and implementing it, you can spread that idea across your entire application or you can encapsulate it. So using Django apps in a Django project as their own mini services with their own APIs at a software level, that's like doing that well is, was our hardest part. Uh, and his response was really, I thought it would say, not uh, designing it so it doesn't go horribly, horribly wrong when it breaks. And that was actually relatively easy because when, because it's a, me everything is message passing, when something breaks, it's just, it stops sending messages. So that means everything kind of turns off instead of blows up. 
uh, which is, I think, it's still a failure mode, which is bad, but it's a better failure mode. It's not the, oh, we need to bring more hardware online to, to handle the load. It's just kind of a load dies. So those are the, the two things. And I also had questions for you, which is like, how do you guys like RPC? Uh, and we can talk about this outside later. But uh, do you guys, how do you do maintainable RPC? How do you guys do service discovery? I like DNS because I also like HTTP. Uh, and what do you guys think on the many code bases versus one code base thing? I know large companies like Google and Facebook love it. And I'm split, so I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts? Okay, I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you again, Adam. Thank you.